Hello! If you're just tuning in, this is our intermission period. While we wait for the last season of ARC 5 to load, let's take the time to review something from the Dreamkeeper series. Specifically, a novel that's set in the Dreamkeeper's universe, called The Wayward Astronomer. Originally drafted March of 2011 on DeviantArt by Jeffrey Thomas, what started as what appeared to be a fan story would end up reaching new heights as a Kickstarter to turn it into a novel came around in March 2016, with official backing from the creators of Dreamkeepers themselves, who not only promoted it and provided promo art and prints, but also interior art for the novel, which, while not an achieved stretch goal, was backed by Jeffrey himself. Because of what happens in the novel, it's pretty easy to establish this as canon to the universe, seeing as it takes place a year before the main story, and yep, this is in fact canon. By word of David and Liz, this is pretty much an official storyline within Dreamkeepers. Now I was asked to review this by Jeffrey, even be provided a review copy, but since I was a backer for the Kickstarter, that part wasn't necessary. Still, since the book releases May 9th, I'm going to take up this request while taking into consideration potential major spoilers that I would need to avoid making. So whether or not you consider this sponsored, it's up to you. As such, I'll only go over the first few chapters to give you an idea on the kind of story we're dealing with. So with that in mind, let us see how this complements the main series. This is The Wayward Astronomer. Now before it really begins, we get an introduction page explaining the dream world to anyone not familiar with Dreamkeepers. It's short enough to describe the kind of denizens that live here and some of the problems with their society in good enough detail. At any rate, Chapter 1. There really is no such thing as true darkness. Tell that to this guy. Anyway, this is Halkian, or Hal for short. He's described as being like a black velociraptor, and based off the first paragraph, his power enables him to see past what normal vision can allow when gazing at the stars, as he can see all kinds of light sources, including supernovas. And you know, I always wondered if the Dreamkeepers know what animals they were, since sometimes in the comic, they either end up speaking the names of certain animals, or imagining their form. Though at least for here I can provide some leeway for it, since not every character receives artwork that shows what they look like. So the reader will have a way to imagine what they would look like a bit better. Also, his tail has a head on the end of it. Neat. In any case, he resides in the Starfall Mountains, as he would be free to use his power if no one in the city would find out. He's not alone though, as he has the company of a companion, Muriel. As they are both astronomers, this is the one place they can really research in peace. They seem to bicker quite a bit, obviously since Hal likes to use his power a lot, but they're good enough friends where she doesn't do anything else beyond yell at him. But then Hal hears the sound of something falling from the sky, a meteor from the sounds of it. Naturally, Hal wants to go find it since every researcher wants to be the first to find stuff. But Miri tells him no, since it'd be too cold to try right now. But can you blame him for being excited? A meteor fell down and he might get to be the first to find it! The two make their way to the crash site, and Miri isn't quite used to the cold, even though she has fur. And I guess the cold doesn't bother this reptile at all. Hey Hal? Yes, Miri? Do you think we each have a destiny? I'm just thinking. Do we have some sort of unique purpose for being here? In relation to plot, you might be about to do something that could mean life and death later. And then in regards to this universe, you'll probably have to fight nightmares at some point in your life. Maybe in the following year, while a bunch of teenagers get involved, Hal assures her that while he doesn't know what their future holds, they'll probably find out together. They eventually reach the meteor and Hal uses his power to check it out only to get a strange reaction from it, as if to say he was blinded by the sun. In fact, it seems to be messing with his senses, since he keeps going toward the damn thing and getting spaced out because of it. Naturally, Mary is worried as all hell, but Hal decides to take a sample. I mean, what could possibly happen? Hands up! Turn around! Slowly! Oh no, it's the cop! And this is why you don't underestimate Central City Authority. 
They always know where you are. No, it's someone who I guess is a mercenary, I think. The wolf, who is later named Miles, isn't alone though as he's with one of our main antagonists of the book, Veneer. Who, yes, I know is a cat. If you're expecting me to get upset that we have another cat villain, don't. And I'll go over later on why I'm not bothered by this at all. They appear to be zealots of some sort of religious group who worship the goddess Celestia, though it seems like she may or may not exist as far as research into her is concerned. She says that they were supposed to be the first to witness the meteor, and not outsiders. Well, I know where this is going. Thou knowest too much! Thou must be smoten! They consider sparing Miri, meaning Hal has to ask what he would need to do to avoid dying. And Veneer asks him if he's touched the meteor. Now this is bad no matter what you say, because either the question implies they wanted you to touch it, or if you didn't, but it didn't matter. They threaten to shoot Miri if he doesn't respond, and while he says that he did and she didn't, the two decide to keep Miri and... As for the raptor... Kill him. Now since this is officially Dreamkeeper's lore, this more or less has to mean they know what other animals are. Though it still baffles me then how a bat came to be born from two non-winged beings. Anyway, a struggle occurs as Miri tries to save Hal, and her pet, Tesla, tries helping, and while Hal manages to kill Miles, in pretty graphic detail too, he fails to defend himself against Veneer, and she seems to go into overkill mode with her shooting. From the detailing, he's pretty much dead at this point. Or is he? Chapter 4, he seems to have survived and is in the care of some people who found him, like old man Mordecai and his granddaughter Sasha. Apparently, he ended up in the Eridu Delta, which according to the map is... All the way down there? Damn! How'd you get swept that far and live? Hell, you got belted with bullets so many times that I'm surprised you didn't bleed out on the way down. Even better, this was four days ago that they found him. Who knows how long it took for him to reach them. In fact, they apparently thought he died, but then he had a heartbeat. Hmm. Mordecai shows him x-rays of his chest area and reveals there's some kind of rock fragments in him. It seems when he got shot, it shattered the sample he had and it's now embedded into his body. It seems to have merged with his body cells and are undergoing a strange mutation. Meaning he's been infected with... The... M virus? Whatever this is, at least it explains why the Order of Celestia wanted it. Perhaps. If this meteor can cause genetic mutations and prevent death like this, then I'm afraid to see what they choose to use this with. At this point, Hal's worried to death over what might have happened with Miri. It's because he had to go out to find the meteor that they got into this mess, so the guilt is very strong. And then Mordecai tells him that, at best, he only has a few months before the majority of his biological structure has changed meaning he'll either have evolved into something, or will likely die. For now, he's told to rest, and as Hal starts to fall asleep, he makes his vow to find Miri and hopefully gaze at the stars together once more. So, from these first few chapters, we established two of our main cast, learned about a cult of sorts, saw that a meteor in this universe can apparently make you immune to death, maybe, and that said cold wants to use it for unknown reasons while keeping Mary alive. But of course, I don't want to go further into detail like this, so let's at least go over some details that might relate to characters established through the promotional art. But first, let's talk about Hal and Mary. Unlike Mace, who was a rebellious child who did a lot of pranks but had a strong heart, Hal comes off as ambitious to the point where he's easily excited on uncovering new mysteries, even if he risks trouble through using his power. And now, he's just seeing said consequence of his endeavor, and not only has to live with it, but is doing what he can to set it right. The book covers this journey of him having to save his friend, while also having to act in ways he's not used to. I mean, he did kill a man, what else would he end up doing? This also coincides with things he's done in the past, and there's a lot of interesting details that lead to one pretty messed up life. This 
true darkness line from the beginning might not just relate to the fact that there's always light in the galaxy, but it might relate to the ever-growing darkness in him that comes from the guilt of what his actions bring. Miri's capture, the death he caused, and then whatever else goes on. What's different compared to others like him is the scenario, and what ends up happening over time. Those are things that tend to be interesting when reading stories like this, and he's likable enough to where you want to see him succeed and not fall into despair. Especially when there's a chance that when all this is over, he might not live in the end. Mary is like a good foil to someone like Hal, as she tends to keep him in line given their friendship, and she almost reminds me of the kind of character Rin from Arc 5 is, and in ways I sort of see this relationship where they don't claim to be lovers, but because of their bond you can believe they secretly are, but otherwise it's just a really strong friendship that they share. Of course, I haven't shown you all that Rin has to offer in that series, but honestly, unlike Rin, I believe Miri gets more development time. Once Hal does reunite with her, they're going to be doing some things with the Order that will test their relationship and their beliefs, since there are some things they need answers to, and sort of the and what sort of motives our villains have. Like our main antagonist of this story, Marcus, who is in fact Hal's twin brother. Because of their family ties to the Mafia, that meant a time where their whole family was killed, and while Hal tried to forget about it, Marcus never did. It's what led him to leading the Order of Celestia, and why he's turned to this goddess into fulfilling his vision, which puts him at odds with Hal since he believes that he shouldn't be killing people over some crazy dream he has. He deeply believes he can change society, allow everyone to use their power, prevent death and all that, also, nothing like the death of their family is repeated. But by committing those same deeds, does that make you any better or worse? Like Veneer, his actions are obviously inexcusable, but you still get where he's coming from to where he's more than two-dimensional, and you want to see him proven wrong. Hal is more or less the opposite of him in a way, and while Marcus tries to get him to his side, it leads to more conflict. And really, the more we learn about these two, the more troubling things get. So the struggle between brothers intensifies over time. It's sort of ironic too that Marcus, the white-scaled brother whose religion almost makes him on the side of light, would be the tragic villain while Hal is the shadow who is trying to set things right. Now, as to why I'm not bothered with Veneer being a cat villain, well, given what we learn about her later, and that's after what happens to her later, she does go from being just a stereotypical cat villain, or rather the villain's lover. She does have some character to her, reasons for being with Marcus, and it's enough to make me forget any grievances with the trope, at least to an extent. Kind of like how I am with Wanda. She might be a dog, but she's likable enough that I wouldn't mind seeing her be a straw hat. Especially if it means more scenes of her and Nami together. Hey, don't you be judging me. You people ship Link with Sidon. Don't tell me that's not the same thing. There's other characters we get acquainted to. Some more important than others, but lend themselves to the development of Hal and the like. At least one of them even having ties to the main comic. Which, if you've been following in either the main story or prelude, you'd know exactly what that is. Either way, this all adds to the overall world of Dream Keepers further than what is already available. We get to see, well, read, about some of the locations that might not get touched upon in the main comic, and the characters who occupy them. It's essentially more world building, and the thing about it, and what helps it make it more canon, it's believable. With a lot of the One Piece movies, or pretty much any anime related movie, things that happen during them you could see happening within continuity due to how it fits within the universe and timeline. However, with those, they tend to suffer with continuity issues in writing, as given the storylines going on in both anime and manga. Sometimes, like in the case with Film Gold, it might look like it could fit, when really it couldn't. Though maybe you'd like to hear me talk more about that in the future, huh? Anyway, the point is, because of when this story takes place, it actually manages to fit within the main timeline, since none of the things that involve Mason friends have yet to occur. And even with the stuff going on in the prelude, 
There's nothing or nobody that would be considered obsolete due to the writer doing something outside of the author's expectancy. Everything that happens is well written enough that it takes into consideration what is going on and doesn't try to base itself on what is considered anticipated plot devices. At the same time though, because this is considered canon, I wouldn't be surprised if any of the things introduced in this story made it into the main comic later, like the meteor. It apparently amplifies one's power, so wouldn't that be something nice for Troika to use against the Nightmare? Wouldn't the Cordova crime syndicate make for an interesting ally for the fight against the Nightmare? Who knows? It's plausible enough to work and could see uses beyond the source material. Really, besides the story, which is just as interesting and well done as the comic, the world building is just stellar. And you don't need to have pictures to show that. Imagination is key when reading, as it fills your mind with what you perceive is what they look like. And because Dream Keepers is set in a fantasy world of anthros, that just brings it up even further in creativity. It's really a welcoming story to behold, and one that I can recommend to any fan of the series. The novel has a lot of action to it, and it can be really intense at times given the descriptions from the writing. The drama is really well written and well paced, there are plenty of likable characters, and the situations are really interesting. It's just a pleasant experience overall. If you're looking for a good read while you're still waiting for the next book of Dream Keepers to be made, well, look no further than this. This book really complements the main series well. It almost feels like that it was written by the creators themselves. But if anything, it just goes to show how creative Jeffrey can be and what he can do with the source material. Again, it comes out May 9th of this year, so definitely check it out when you can. Next time, we'll resume with the rest of Arc 5 with the third and final season. I hope you enjoyed this information, and I'll see you then.